This is going to be a review of Chapter 1, Evolution of the Themes of Biology and Scientific Inquiry. Uh, this is not meant to compensate for the textbook at all. This is just going to be, in addition to the textbook, some additional information and maybe a, a, um, a verbal presentation of some of the information for the textbook. But certainly, there is a lot of content in the textbook that's not in this PowerPoint presentation. So please make sure you read the book very thoroughly. Okay, let's uh, move through this. I'm going to go through it kind of quickly because uh, there's a lot of slides and some of them that uh, we do not need to spend any time on um, just because they're adequately covered in the textbook and uh, other slides just because they're just uh, pictures of something that was on a previous slide. So uh, rather than chop up the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, I've left it intact. So we'll kind of move through this. Okay, here we go. So inquiring about life. An organism's adaptations to its environment are the result of evolution. If you find a beach mouse, for instance, at the beach, you'll find that it's well matched or it's been adapted to its local background. This is all uh, evidence that evolution is the process of change that has transformed life on Earth. There's a picture of a beach mouse. You can see that its coloration uh, matches the sand underneath it and also the vegetation to its side, so it makes it a little bit... Uh, less suspect to predators, uh, aerial predators. Whereas this mouse, which is a little bit further inland, you can tell has a darker coat and uh, is a little bit more, again, adapted to its local vegetation, local surroundings, less obvious to the, uh, the predator. If you took the mouse from the previous slide and swapped uh, this mouse out and put them in the opposite locales, they would probably be much easier for a predator to spot. So these are examples of adaptation over time. Okay, biology is a scientific study of life, and biologists tend to ask questions such as, how does a single cell develop into an organism? It's a quest. It's an ongoing inquiry about the nature of life. Biologists ask questions. It's every question is answered with another question, ultimately, because um, there's so much we don't know, and we're discovering new things all the time, and um, that's part of the excitement of biology and, and why we do it. It's uh, just fascinating to learn about the world around us. So life defies a simple one-sentence definition. If we try to define life, we can't just say, well, it's something that reproduces, or it's something that has intelligence, or it's something that thinks, or it's something that breathes. Um, there's always exceptions to the rules. So when we define life, we tend to take a look at a lot of different aspects, and uh, those combined tend to give us a pretty good uh, identifiable recognition of something that's living versus uh, any independent independent piece of that would probably still be an example of something that would uh, not be life but would look like life at least from that one aspect so let's take a look at that in a second life is recognized by what living things do for instance, uh, what I was talking about before, these all are things that exemplify life. There's order, there's evolutionary adaptation, there's regulation like as far as body temperature, the ability to reproduce, response to the environment, it can respond to stimuli for instance, uh, the ability to grow and develop, and the ability to process energy. All of these things are required for a definition of something that's living. Any one of these or two or in any combination of two or three or four of these perhaps may uh, all exist in something that's non-living. But uh, certainly with all seven of these um, um, independent features, you would have something that would uh, identify a living organisms as far as we know. Okay. Okay, so first uh, section of chapter one, biology is a subject of enormous scope. There are five unifying themes throughout biology, at least as far as the, the Campbell-Reese biology textbook that we're using does. Uh, it's organization, information, energy and matter, interactions and evolution. Life can be studied at different levels, from molecules to the entire living planet. Thus, enormous range can be divided into different levels of biological organization. For instance, the biosphere, which is the Earth and all of its living components, like uh, six, seven, eight miles up into space where our atmosphere ends, all the way down to the, uh, the deepest parts of the ocean where there are living structures. So that's uh, the, the biosphere. Uh, the biosphere is broken down into ecosystems, which is further broken down into communities and further broken down into populations. And then within a population, you have individual organisms. Organisms themselves can be broken down into smaller components, such as organs. The organs can be broken down into tissues. Tissues can be broken down into cells. Cells can be broken down into organelles, and organelles can be broken down into molecules. This is a good slide to know.
Okay, emergent properties result from the arrangement and interaction of parts within the system. Emergent properties characterize non-biological entities as well. Let's talk about this a little bit. So say you have a bike, box full of bike parts. Uh, you got a seat, a steering wheel, and wheels, and um, I don't know, a bell, and a chain, and uh, pedals, and so on and so forth. Uh, all of those things in that box obviously are, are parts of a bike, but there's no property, there's no emerging property that comes from it as it is. However, if you were to put all those pieces together into their proper functioning roles, then you would have something that works. When you have that functioning bicycle, you have an emerging property, and that emerging property would be transportation. So emerging properties result from the arrangement and interactions of parts within a system. Now, the reductionist approach studies isolated components of a living system. If we wanted to take a look at emergent properties, biologists could complement reductionism with systems biology, which is an analysis of the interactions among the parts of a biological system. So you can look at the individual pieces. Uh, you can also look at how those individual pieces play part of the whole um, in a biological system. So systems biology being used to study life at all levels. And, and you'll see this in biology a lot. Uh, you'll see organismal biologists working with systems biologists to try to understand how things function in, in cycles or ecosystems, perhaps. At each level of the biological hierarchy, we find a correlation between structure and function. Analyzing a biological structure gives us clues about what it does and how it works. Conversely, knowing the function of something provides insight into its structure and organization. The cell is the smallest unit of organization that can perform all activities required for life. Every cell is enclosed by a membrane that regulates passage of materials between the cell and its outside environment. The cells of bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic, those are domains, um, while all other forms of life are composed of eukaryotic cells. So those are the three big domains that we'll take a look at in a second. A eukaryotic cell has membrane enclosed organelles, the largest of which is usually the nucleus. By comparison, a prokaryotic cell is simpler and usually smaller and does not contain a nucleus or other membrane bound organelles. So here's a picture of a eukaryotic cell. You can see uh, there's lots of circular structures in there, spherical structures, and uh, those are evidence of uh, items that are packaged up inside of a membrane. Whereas if you look here at the prokaryotic cell, you can see that uh, it looks a little bit more sporadic. Um, you don't see a whole lot of individually packaged items in there. They might be blended throughout rather than condensed into specific locales uh, bound by a membrane. Here, you just have the outer membrane, but uh, inside of that, like for instance, the nucleus is not contained in the membrane. These, this is evidence of a prokaryotic cell. Within cell structures called chromosomes contain genetic uh, material in the form of DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. We'll take a look at this extensively later on in the uh, future units. You probably remember talking about chromosomes and mitosis and meiosis. We'll get to that in the future as well. Um, each chromosome contains one long DNA molecule with hundreds or thousands of genes on it. And genes are the unit of inheritance. They encode information for the building of molecules that synthesize, uh, that are synthesized within the cell. The genetic information encoded by DNA directs the development of an organism. So here we're showing a sperm cell that's about to fertilize an egg cell. So the DNA from the sperm and the DNA from the egg will uh, will fuse into a zygote, and that's the fertilized egg, which got DNA from both parents. It will eventually develop into an embryo that has copies of the DNA from, from both parents to some extent, and then the offspring will have those uh, inherited traits from both parents. The molecular structure of DNA accounts for its ability to store information. Each DNA molecule is made up of two long chains arranged in a double helix. Each chain is made up of four kinds of chemical building blocks. These are called nucleotides, and they're abbreviated A, G, C, and T. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and uh, those are for DNA. If you remember from biology one, RNA is slightly different. Okay, so here's the double helix. Gs will bond with Cs. T's will bond with A's. So if you look up here, you'll see, for instance, you have a, um, you have a, perhaps this is an A right here, bonded to a T. Right below it here, you have a C bonded to a G. So let's see, C, G, C, and then we said that was A and T. So here, this would be an A bonded to a T, 
uh, down here. It looks like this is a uh, A down in here in this little region. Oops, sorry. Right here in that region, they are bonded to a T as it's twisting in the helix. Here we've got a, uh, a C and a G, etc., a G and a C, so on and so forth. And as we go through, we can see how this will relate to this uh, linear single strand chain of DNA. Okay, for many genes, the sequence provides the blueprint for making a protein. Protein encoding genes control protein production indirectly. This is how it happens. DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into a protein. So DNA is going to transcribe. I, I highlight the C here. C comes before L. DNA transcribed into RNA, which is going to be translated L into protein. And those are just the C and the L from transcription and translation. If you can remember this, that's really important. That's the central dogma of molecular biology. DNA makes DNA gets transcribed into RNA. RNA gets uh, translated into a protein. We'll talk more about that in the future as well. Gene expression is the process of converting information from a gene up here in the DNA sector to a cellular product, a protein. So this is going to ultimately, so the proteins are actually going to perform functions in the body. So that's what we call expression. So this is gene expression here because it goes from the gene, from the DNA, to being expressed as a functional protein throughout the body. Okay, so here's uh, some pictures that kind of exemplify this. So at the left here, A, we have the lens cells are tightly packed with transparent proteins called crystalline. So you have these proteins that make up the lens cells of the uh, lens and the eye. So a lens cell uses information in DNA to make crystalline. So you get the gene for crystalline out of the DNA. It's got a particular sequence of H, G, C's, and T's. Those will get transcribed into messenger RNA. Now the only thing that you really need to be concerned about here is remember in DNA you have A, G, C, T. In uh, messenger RNA or RNAs, you have uh, T's replaced with U, so you have A, G, C, and U. Okay, so the thymines get replaced with uracil and RNA, and then that messenger RNA will get translated into amino, a chain of amino acids, which when folded up will form a protein, the crystalline protein in this case. Okay, an organism's genome is its entire library of genetic instructions. Genomics is the study of the sets of genes in one or more species. Proteomics is the study of whole sets of proteins and their properties. The entire set of proteins expressed by a given cell, tissue, or organ is called the proteome. The genomics approach depends on high throughput technology, which yields enormous amounts of data. Bioinformatics, which is the use of computational tools to pr process a large volume of data, utilizes computers extensively. Bioinformatics. Anytime you see the word informatics, you're thinking about computers because uh, you're taking a lot of information regarding uh, life systems or life structures. You're processing it through a computer to make some sort of statistical sense out of it to see cause and effect. Um, and these, these genomics approach are usually put together uh, by an interdisciplinary team. You usually have uh, biochemists and, and molecular biologists and cell biologists and bioinformatics specialists and all kinds of different types of scientists working together um, to study genomics or work on genomics research. Okay, here's a theme. Life requires the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. The input of energy from the sun and the transformation of energy from one form to another make life possible. The chemical energy generated by plants and other photosynthetic organisms, which are called producers, is passed along to consumers. Those are the things that eat the producers. So, for instance, light from the sun uh, is going to go ahead and uh, be consumed by plants, converted into chemical energy via photosynthesis, Organisms, in this case they've got like some sort of worm or whatever, that's going to eat the leafy plant, which will then be eaten by like a bird or something, and then the bird will be eaten by some other predator, and that predator will be eaten by maybe a human or so on and so forth. So the energy gets passed from the sunlight directly or indirectly from one organism to the next, and that's why we eat food, we get energy out of it, and that's energy that originally came from the sun. Okay, so you got this energy flow in the cycle here. This is something that's good to know. 
When organisms use energy to perform work, some energy is lost to the surroundings as heat. As a result, energy flows through an ecosystem, usually entering as light and exiting as heat. Chemicals cycle within the ecosystem where they are used and then recycled. Here's another theme. From molecules to ecosystems, interactions are important in biological systems. Interactions between the components of the system ensure smooth integration of all the parts. This holds true equally well for components of an ecosystem and the molecules in a cell. Interactions between components such as organs, tissues, cells, and molecules that make up living organisms are crucial to their smooth operation. They have to work together very nicely. Many biological processes can self-regulate through a mechanism called feedback. Now there's two types of feedback that you'll see, um, and these are feedback regulation types. Um, there's positive and negative feedback, and we're going to talk about those. The thing to remember is negative feedback is going to be the most common form that you're going to see in living organisms, which is that second bullet there. So feedback regulation, which is the output or product of a process, regulates the process itself. In other words, you have something go through a system and you get an end result. Then that end result is going to either cause the input back into that system again to either increase or decrease. If it causes it to increase, that is going to be positive feedback. If it is going to cause it to decrease, uh, that is going to be negative feedback. The example here, they're using um, glucose and uh, diabetes, for instance, insulin. So you have a uh, insulin producing cell in the pancreas. So the pancreas is producing insulin, which is entering into the bloodstream. Uh, it's going to bind to glucose. Uh, when glucose is present, for instance, after you eat a meal or you eat a candy bar or something like that, the insulin will be secreted by the pancreas into the, uh, the blood and the uh, insulin will bind to the glucose molecules, will allow it to cause them to be taken up by um, cells in the body. The glucose itself can't get directly into the cells. It needs something to help it get in, which is the insulin, and so the insulin is important. Now, if you look at this, um, the fourth step here, lowered blood glucose does not stimulate insulin secretion. So in, for instance, at the end here, step four, you've got this insulin produced, right? So it's not going to cause the input of more insulin into the system. It's going to shut it down because you've got lower glucose on the back end than you do on the front end. So it's going to be a negative feedback loop. It's going to shut the pancreas from producing more insulin down so you don't need it as often. Now, if there's suddenly a surge in the in the body of glucose and stuff, it's going to, you know, the, the, the system's going to go ahead and notice that. And again, the pancreas will start secreting insulin back into the system so it can bond to the glucose and be taken up by the cells. Okay, ecosystems and organisms interactions with other organisms and the physical environment. At the ecosystem level, each organism interacts with other organisms. These interactions may be beneficial or harmful to one or both of the organisms, and organisms also interact continuously with the physical factors in their environment, and the environment is affected by the organisms living there. So here, again, you have sunlight coming in. You have, if I'm going to go to the right here, CO2 uh, leaves are taking up the CO2 from the air and they're going to, through the process of photosynthesis, release oxygen. Animals will eat the leaves and fruit from the tree. They'll return those nutrients and minerals to the soil in their waste products. Water and minerals in the soil are taken up by the tree through its roots. Leaves will fall to the ground and will be decomposed by organisms that will return minerals to the soil and around and around the system goes. Each organism interacts continuously with physical factors in the environment. Humans interact with our environment, sometimes with dire consequences. Over the past 150 years, humans have greatly increased the burning of fossil fuels and the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This has resulted in global warming, which is just one aspect of climate change. Wind and precipitation patterns are also shifting. Extreme weather events such as storms and droughts are occurring more often. And as habitats deteriorate, plant and animal species shift their ranges to more suitable locations. Populations of many species are shrinking in size or even disappearing. 
Okay, core theme. Evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life. Evolution is the one idea that makes logical sense of everything we know about living organisms. The scientific explanation for both the unity and diversity of organisms is evolution. The concept that living organisms are modified descendants of common ancestors. We see this all the time, all around us. We see evidence of it uh, in ourselves. We see evidence of it in other organisms. We certainly see other evidence evidence of it in, um, in uh, biological organisms at the uh, very small scales as well. An abundance of evidence supports the occurrence of evolution. Uh, as uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, which is one of the famous biologists at the turn of the uh, 1900s, said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Let me see here, make sure I didn't skip a slide. There we go. Approximately 1.8 million species have been identified and named to date. This is talking about classifying, how we classify different organisms of life. So there's 1.8 million species that have been identified in name. Each species has a two-part name, the genus to which the species belongs, and a species name unique to that species. So one's like a first name and one's like a last name. Uh, for instance, Homo sapiens is the name of our species. Homo is the genus and sapiens the, uh, the species name. Estimates, uh, the total number of species that actually exist on Earth are from 10 million to 100 million. So if we've only discovered 1.8 million out of 10 million, that's approximately 18 percent. Uh, if we've discovered only 1.8 million and there's 100 million, that's only 1.8 percent of the total amount of organisms that exist on the earth. So there's a good chance that if you go into biology and you want to be a uh, taxonomist or a classifier and go out and study uh, biological organisms in the world or even in the laboratory, you very well could find something or discover something new and get to name it. Organisms are currently divided into three domains. Uh, domains excuse me. They are named bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Again, bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic and eukarya are uh, eukaryotes. The prokaryotes are bacteria, archaea, as the slide says, and eukarya includes all of the eukaryotic organisms. Okay, domain eukarya is further divided into the protists and three kingdoms. So you have protists, plants, fungi, and animals. Plants are organisms that produce their own food by photosynthesis. Fungi absorb nutrients from the environment. Animals eat their food. And then you have the protists. The most numerous and diverse uh, group of eukaryotes are the protists. These are mostly single-celled organisms. They're classified further into several groups. And some protists are less closely related to each other than they are to plants, animals, or other fungi. So here you go. Here's uh, A, B, and C are the three main domains. You've got bacteria and archaea, which are the prokaryotes. And then you've got C, which is domain eukaryotes, which are further broken into the plants, the fungi, the animals, and the protists. Again, it talked about the protists being, again, further divided as all classes are. Okay, a striking unity underlies the diversity of life. For example, DNA is a universal genetic language common to all organisms. Unity is evident in many features of cell structure. The history of life is documented by fossils and other evidence is the saga of a changing Earth, which is billions of years old. Uh, if you look here on the left side, you've got cilia on the uh, exterior of a paramecium that allow it to maneuver. If you take a cross-section of the cilia, you'll see that it's identical to the cilia of the windpipe of human organisms. So they are structurally identical. This is uh, just to show that uh, um, there, there's a lot of unity throughout there, throughout different types of structures. Uh, the... Uh, um, Evolutionary processes have found things that seem to, to work well and has replicated it in, in other environments or they've, uh, they've uh, ad not replicated it because that sounds intentional, but it, they have adapted because the structures are simple and they work well and they, they, uh, they suffice for the, the necessary function. May not be the most efficient thing, but they work. So here, if you look, you can see there's, I think, nine on the outer ring. There's nine doublets on the outside. Uh, they look like eights almost. Uh, and then there's uh, two on the inside, and that's the cross-section of a cilium. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's on the hair of a paramecium or inside of a windpipe. They're structurally um, going to look the same. Okay, Charles Darwin, The Theory of Natural Selection. Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. That's a book he wrote in 1859. It was published. Uh, he made two main points, that species showed evidence of descent with modification from common ancestors, and that natural selection is the mechanism behind descent with modification. Now, Darwin's theory explained the duality of unity and diversity. 
there's a picture of young Darwin um, when he was a um, uh, ship's naturalist on the HMS Beagle traveling around South America and the Pacific. And um, there's a copy, uh, I guess, a, a page of the manuscript uh, from 1859 when he published his work. pictures and some videos They're probably referred to in the textbook okay Darwin observed that individuals in a population vary in their traits many of which seem to be heritable more offspring are produced than survive and so therefore competition is inevitable and species generally suit their environment Darwin reasoned that individuals individuals that are best suited to the environment are more likely to survive and reproduce and over time more individuals individuals in a population will have the advantageous traits and evolution occurs as the unequal reproductive success of individuals. The natural environment selects for the propagation of beneficial traits and he called this natural selection. So here's an example. You've got some black, some gray, and some white um, bugs against a black background. If you have a bird that comes along, maybe because of its vis visible or visual acuity, it can more easily notice the white bugs or the light gray bugs rather than the uh, dark bugs. And so it eliminates individuals with certain traits. And then um, because the black ones tend to be the ones that survive because they're not as easily seen, they, when they reproduce, their offspring are genetically going to be dark as well. So it increases the, the future population of the dark uh, organisms. And then over time, you get this increased frequency of traits that will further enhance the survival of the organism just because um, it's the one that happens to survive. Natural selection results in the adaptation of organisms to the circumstances of their way of life and their environment. For example, bat wings are an example of adaptation. There's a pretty cool picture of a bat. The shared anatomy of mammalian limbs reflects the inheritance of the limb structure from a common ancestor. Fossils provide additional evidence of anatomical unity from descent with modification. Darwin proposed that natural selection could cause an ancestral species to give rise to two or more descendant species. For example, the finch species of the Galapagos Islands are descended from a common ancestor. If you go to the Galapagos Islands, you'll find that on each of the different islands there are different species of finches, but they are all descended from a original finch or, or a couple of finches that had um, made it to the Galapagos Islands to begin with. Evolutionary relationships are often illustrated with tree-like diagrams that show ancestors and their descendants, such as this. So here you can see how they have branched over time and who is related to what and at what point in time, roughly, when they were related. And so you can see that the, there's an ancestral finch that has given rise to these six, uh, six uh, present species of finch on the Galapagos Islands. Okay, in studying nature, scientists make observations and form and test hypotheses. The word science is derived from Latin and means to know. Inquiries is, inquiry is a search for information and explanations of natural phenomena, and scientists use a process of inquiry that includes making observations, forming logical hypotheses, and then testing them. Biologists describe natural structures and processes. This approach is based on observation and the analysis of data. Recorded observations are called data. Qualitative data often takes the form of recorded descriptions, and quantitative data are often expressed as numerical measurements, usually, usually organized into tables and graphs. So think of quantitative, think of quantities. It's got a number to it. Qualitative is something that's going to be descriptive, something that you can describe using your senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, etc. Picture of Dr. Goodall. Uh, she actually did a lot of work working with primates in the Gombe region of Africa and uh, was uh, able to, because of her research, uh, discover that uh, uh, the primates that she was working with were actually able to utilize tools, which uh, had kind of changed the definition of what, uh, what humans were. Because uh, if you went into a textbook 40, 50 years ago, in a classroom or uh, into a lecture, you would have heard that uh, definition of being human is somebody that can utilize a tool. We were defined as the, the tool makers or the tool users. But uh, her work in the, the Gombe discovered that uh, primates, other types of primates, actually also could utilize tools. And so that kind of changed our definition of humanity. 
Okay, inductive reasoning draws conclusions through the logical process of induction. Repeating specific ob observations can lead to important generalizations. For example, the sun always rises in the east, or all organisms are made of cells. In science, a hypothesis is an explanation based on observations and assumptions that leads to a testable prediction. It must lead to predictions that can be tested by making additional observations or by performing experiments. An experiment is a scientific test carried out under controlled uh, conditions. For example, observation. Your desk lamp doesn't work. Question, why doesn't your desk lamp work? Hypothesis one, the bulb's not screwed in properly. Hypothesis two, the bulb is burnt out. Both of these hypotheses are testable. That's a critical part of a hypothesis. It has to be testable. Okay, and there's kind of a flow chart for that discussion or diagram that we just talked about. Okay, now, on the other hand, deductive reasoning uses general premises to make specific predictions. Initial observations may give rise to multiple hypotheses. We can never prove that a hypothesis is true. That's really important to remember. We can never prove that a hypothesis is true. But testing it over and over again in a lot of different ways with different types of uh, experimental procedures can give you data that can significantly increase your confidence in your uh, position of whether or not it may actually be correct. Again, we can't ever prove it fully, but we tend to think that, okay, we've got millions of pieces of evidence that I'll prove it's probably true, so therefore it's going to probably be true um, until we find something that may disprove it. A hypothesis must be testable. For example, a hypothesis that ghosts fooled with the desk lamp cannot be tested. Therefore, that's a uh, not a hypothesis. That's a philosophical statement. Supernatural and religious explanations are outside the bounds of science. The scientific method is an idealized process of inquiry. However, very few scientific inquiries adhere rigidly to this approach. Backtracking and rethinking may be necessary partway through the process. Okay, so here's a, a format you can explore and discover. You can get analysis and feedback from the community. Uh, you can talk about societal benefits and outcomes, and you can form and test hypotheses based on these um, uh, regions or areas. Here's a little bit more uh, specific information that you can go ahead and read on these particular areas. And I think for the most part, uh, I think that's almost the end of this uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, I think we have a couple slides left. Okay, color patterns of animals vary widely in nature, sometimes even between members of the same species. Two populations of mice belong to the same species, but with different color patterns are found in different environments. The beach mouse lives on white sand dunes with sparse vegetation. The inland mouse lives on darker soil. Here on the top screen, you can see the beach mouse against the white sand. It's got a white coat. Why? Because it's less likely back to that uh, white and gray and dark black uh, beetles against the black background. And which one the aerial predator is going to pick off? Of course, the one that's going to contrast most likely. Um, so here you've got a uh, beach mouse against the white sand dunes. It's uh, much more easily hidden than perhaps if that inland mouse from the lower picture were on the beach. It'd be easier to observe against the white background. And vice versa is true. If you put that beach mouse in the inland area, uh, the white against the uh, brown background, it's going to stick out more to aerial predators in those regions. And again, this isn't something that's intentional. This is something that just happens due to predation. And over time, the frequency of the darker colors tends to increase because um, their parents were probably survivors, whereas those that had uh, colors that contrasted wildly with the background probably uh, did not survive, the parents did not survive, so there were no offspring, etc. And so the frequency of the um, um, matching population to the background uh, is going to increase while that with the contrasting background will decrease. Okay, the two types of mice match the coloration of their habitats. Natural predators of these mice are visual hunters. Uh, Sumner hypothesized that the color patterns had evolved as adaptations to protect the mice from predators. In 2010, Hopi Hector and a group of students tested the hypothesis. They predicted that mice did not match that did not match their habitat would be preyed on more heavily than mice that did match the surroundings. They built some models of the mice. They painted them to match one of the surroundings, and they placed equal numbers of each type in each of the habitats. They then recorded the signs of predation. So what they found in the beach habitat with the uh, the fake 
white mouse in the fake dark mouse that the fake white mouse was picked off significantly less than the fake dark mouse. Uh, it had less signs of um, bite marks or uh, fewer of them were gone if they were um, if they were white, but if they were dark, they tended to have more, uh, considerably more bite marks or more of those fake mouse had been picked off by the birds and uh, had disappeared from the from the area. Same thing in the inland habitat. We had exactly the opposite happening. The, uh, the white mouse against the dark background showed more uh, showed a significant increase in the amount of predation or had disappeared from the site altogether if they had been picked up by a, an, a hawk or a large uh, predator. Um, whereas the ones that were dark brown, less of them, not none, but less of them were picked off. You can see that the, the data on both sets were almost identical but inverse. In a control experiment, an experimental group, the non-camouflaged mice in this case, is compared with the control group, which was the camouflaged mice. Experimental variables are features or quantities that vary in an experiment. In this case, the independent variable is the one that is manipulated by the researchers, while the dependent variable is the one predicted to be affected as a response. In the context of science, a theory is broader in scope than a hypothesis. In general, it can lead to a new testable hypothesis and supported by a large body of evidence in comparison to a hypothesis. Now, uh, at the end of the last section, most scientists work in teams, which often include graduate and undergraduate students. Good communications are important in order to share results through seminars, publications, and websites. When you conduct research, you want to make that information available to other people so that they can use your, your science in their experimentation or use your data or uh, data to support their theories as well. Scientists check each other's claims by performing the experiments over and over again. If experimental results are not repeatable, the original claim will have to be changed. It's not usual, unusual for different scientists to work on the same research question. Scientists cooperate by sharing data about model organisms. The goal of science is to understand natural phenomena. The goal of technology is to apply the scientific knowledge for a specific purpose, like uh, the ability to uh, utilize electricity to heat up toast and, and or heat up bread and make toast. That's uh, applying um, some specific scientific um, capabilities like the ability to toast bread uh, and making a toaster out of it that's applying it and forming a uh, technology. So biology is marked by discoveries while technology is marked by inventions like the toaster. The combination of science and technology has dramatic effects on society. For example, the discovery of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick, Quick Crick, excuse me, allowed for advances in DNA technology, such as testing for hereditary diseases. Debates on technology center more on should we do it than can we do it. Ethical issues can arise from new technologies, but have as much to do with politics, economics, and cultural values as with science and technology. Many important inventions have occurred where different cultures and ideas mix. For example, the printing press relied on innovations from China, paper and ink, and Europe, mass production of paper and mills. Science benefits from diverse views from different racial and ethnic groups, and from both women and men. The more voices heard, the more robust, valuable, and productive the scientific interchange can be. Yeah, and I think that's it for the chapter. The rest are just some uh, images and pictures that can be used for slides. Uh, thank you for listening to chapter one. I'll have the uh, chapters two and three here completed shortly and uh, posted for your review. Thank you for your time.